bulletins. We're going to prepare our hearts for communion. <laughs> All right. Come on up. Come on up, you guys. Let's have a seat. Responsive greeting as we prepare our hearts. As they were eating, he took the bread and he blessed it and he broke it and gave it to them and said, Take. This is my body. And he said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of profaning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a man examine himself and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Father God, as we come before you this morning, we do come before you. Thank you for the invitation to your table. Thank you for your grace. Thank you that we receive the elements, though common elements in our eye, but in faith we thank you that they represent your broken body, your shed blood. Your blood, Jesus, cleanses us from sin. We live in a, such a distracted world you for a sacred moment of coming to church. Thank you for a sacred moment of coming to your table. Don't let us take communion just to get it over with. By your work, Holy Spirit, that you would prepare our hearts to receive this sacred we don't have to work anything up. We don't have to go through the laundromat of sin in our life. We thank you that you've cleansed us. But yet we want to be honest and say, my attitude, my life, my words have not been perfect at all, Lord. thank you that by placing our faith in you, Jesus, we are justified by your blood. We're declared righteous. Father, I specifically pray that if there's a person here, even online, who's watching and maybe might grab some elements in their own home. And, and, but for people here who feel like I don't feel worthy. We're worthy in you, Jesus. You invite us to your table. You created a place at your table for us. We thank you that what we celebrate and receive is really an answer to our greatest prayer of being right with you. And we just thank you praise you for that. As we worship you, Lord, now, both in the receiving of the elements and the singing to you, let's do so, Lord, to honor you, to glorify your name. We just thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen. He took the bread and he blessed it and he said, this is my body. 
took the cup and he said, this is the new covenant. The new covenant poured out in my blood. This represents the blood of Jesus. You all know that. But I think we forget the power of the new covenant over our life. No, we don't live by the old covenant anymore. Again, as I always say in communion time, we don't ask that you be a member of this church. Some, some churches do that more exclusive line. But we don't. We ask that you know Jesus. That you honor him and want to honor him in your life. So if I have the servers come up, I'll serve you guys, you ladies. We're going to put one guy over here. Milford, just come over here with Melanie. We'll just do it that way. Just stand up here. I'll serve you body of Christ's nature. The blood of Jesus spread out for you. Thomas, the body of Christ, and the blood of Jesus. Melanie, the body of Christ, and the blood of Jesus flow out for you. Milford, the body of Christ, and the blood of the Lord Jesus flow out for you. For those of you that might be new or kind of forget, take a piece of bread, dip it in the cup. Just invite you to come forward. You're all invited to come to know Jesus and receive worship as you come.
sin didn't catch you surprised. That Jesus was positioned and prepared as the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. Thank you, Lord, that your preparation for our lives started before. you stay very grateful for your love. In the name of Jesus, amen. You may be seated. Second King, Second Kings chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. Interesting, miraculous Old Testament story under Elisha the prophet. As I continue on this prayer journey series, I'm going to talk about something real simple. This could be a real simple message, not that any messages aren't simple, but I'm going to challenge us with three things about our individual and sometimes our corporate prayer life but perhaps more individually in your life and in my life. I always want to plug in the bulletin this prayer Wednesday thing for 15 minutes every Wednesday to pray uh, just for people. Maybe there are people sitting around you. Maybe they are people who uh, just come to your mind, but allow yourself the time on Wednesdays to pray. I mean, I hope you're praying more than that for our church, for people around you, and for things in life. Uh, but just trying to focus all of us on Wednesdays for 15 minutes, wherever you're at, wherever you're driving, wherever you're gardening, wherever you're, whatever you're doing, to pray. To pray for people that are sitting around you. That's praying for the church. People who are serving, leaders in the church, whatever, however the Holy Spirit leads you. Um, 2 Kings chapter 6 verses 1 through 6 now the sons of the prophets said to Elisha see the place where we dwell under your charge is too small for us we need some bigger lodging let us go to the Jordan and each of us there get, a, get there a log and let us make a place for us to dwell there and so Elisha answered, go. And then one of them said, be pleased to come with us your, to be with your servants. And he said, I'll go with you. And so he went with them. And when they came to the Jordan, they cut down trees. But as one was felling a log, his axe head fell into the water. And he cried out, alas, my master. He's, he's crying out to Elisha. It was borrowed. It's one thing to lose my own tools, but I borrowed that tool. How many of you have tools and you borrowed them, or you didn't have tools and you borrowed them and then you lost it? You feel more of a burden because you borrowed it, and you, now you got to go to Ace Hardware and buy another one. It was borrowed. Then the man of God, Elisha, said, Where did it fall? And when he showed him the place, he cut off a stick and threw it in there and made the iron float. And Elisha said, take it up. So he reached out his hand and he took it. Isn't that a great story? Where do 
I want to start with this one. A few weeks ago, I was in the Heights at McDonald's, and they were really bombarded with a lot of lack of workers in, in, in a long line. So it, it afforded me the opportunity to uh, stand in line for probably 10 minutes or so. All I wanted was some coffee, but whatever. They were just really bombarded with work, with a lack of workers. So as soon as I got in line, these two young ladies, uh, they, they weren't cutting in line, they just kind of came up to the counter and said, we noticed that the trash was taken out to the canister. I lost my debit card. Can I go out to your canister outside and look for it? Of course, the person behind the counter goes, yeah, go ahead. And I'm thinking, now I didn't make this a prayer moment. Like, let me pray for you. I should have, but I didn't. But I, there are two teenage girls. She said, oh, we lost our debit card. I lost my debit card. Can I go out to your canister and look for it? But what came to my mind was, you ain't going to find it. Looking through the garbage for your debit card? You ain't going to find it. I mean, I could see how that happened. You, put your, you bought some, you put your debit card on your tray, and then you accidentally dump it into the canister, and then the garbage is taken out to the canister. Well, before I got my coffee, it's probably about 10 minutes to wait there. Before I got my coffee, she came back in. We found it. That's awesome. How many of you have lost your credit card? How many of you have lost your keys? How many of you have lost your Bibles and here at church and you didn't know it was missing until about Thursday? <laughs> That's a different sermon. <laughs> How many of you have lost your cup of coffee? You forgot where you put it. I lost a seven iron on a golf course. And it wasn't until the ninth hole I realized, I don't have my seven iron. I went back and it was gone. Yes, I prayed. Um, and and I, it was never returned to the clubhouse. And I didn't like that seven iron anyway, so I, I bought a new one. This story is just a stupid axe head. It stands alone in the second king's chapters under the ministry of Elisha. It apparently has no larger significance to other people. I mean, Elisha did some mighty miracles under the power of in 2 Kings chapter 2, the people come to him in Jericho and say, the city is well, but people are dying because of our water. You know what he did? He got a new bowl. He threw salt in the bowl. He threw the bowl. He threw the salt uh, into the water system. And then he, and he, I have to read 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 21 through 23. He said, let no more deaths or miscarriages happen because of the water. I mean, he's raising people from the dead. He told the Shunammite woman, this time next year, you're going to have a boy. And then he raised the boy from the dead when he died a few years later. I mean, he's doing powerful things. It's Elisha who says, open their eyes, Lord. And they saw the chariots of fire that were more than the army of Syria. And then we have this stupid story. The prophets say, we need some more lodging. Okay. Let's go cut some trees by the Jordan. They're cutting trees, and the axe head falls off, falls in the water. Where'd it fall? He cuts off a stick, throws it kind of nearby, and the iron head floats, and it's retrieved, and it's almost a casual thing. Now get back to work. You're not going to use that as an excuse. So what, you lose the axe head? Get back to chopping wood now. I tried online to find a picture. This is an ancient picture. This could have been what it looked like, but I don't think so. I think the stick was, was out further in the water, but this was an ancient rendering of this story. See the axe head down in the bottom and the other prophets reaching out to get it. It doesn't take away from the text here. 
I just think the stick that he's holding, he didn't hold the stick. And I'll get into that later. I think he threw it in the water. Why, I do not know. But here's what I want to do with this story. I want to talk about our individual prayer lives. And that's why I started with the debit card. Because you'll probably walk away today with a feeling of, I need to pray over specific things in my life. And that's probably the big picture idea here today. So here we go. I'm going to give you three challenges, three encouragements. They encourage me when I think of these three things. Very simple things about our prayer journey, about our individual prayer life, perhaps your prayer life in a group, perhaps our, our church prayer life, which sometimes we don't get real specific about things. Um, and so we'll talk about that. Number one, God really cares about specifics. God really cares about specifics. Every detail, the more intimate, the better of our lives. It is interesting, isn't it, that when this axe head falls off, Elisha, by the Spirit of God, is drawn to it. It's just a stupid axe head. That's all it is. And in fact, causing it to float doesn't seem to have much more significance. It's just kind of one of those dumb, trivial things, but not to God, not to the Spirit of God, and not to this prophet who said, I borrowed the axe head, I borrowed somebody's golf clubs, and now I lost one. It's one, it's one thing to lose your own, but when you borrow somebody else's. And it was a burden on his life, and Elisha is drawn to that specific because the Spirit of God cared about that specific accent. Let's just go with that for a moment. God really cares about specifics of our lives. And I think you all agree with that. Let me give you a couple of challenges about when you think about specific details of your life. He really cares about the specific issue that you really don't pray about anymore. I don't care what it is in our lives. There are specific things that we just aren't even on our prayer radar anymore. We've just given up about it, whatever they are. He really cares about those. I know here, here's a pushback that many people may give to me. They, they would say, Pastor, it sounds selfish when we think about specific things of our lives. We need, we need to be more mature in the faith and we need to pray for things that, oh, we need to pray for the people in Florida who are undergoing the hurricane or, or the ravages, the uh, people in Maui who have been devastated. We need to pray for the persecuted church. Yes, we do. In fact, a couple of weeks ago, I challenged all of us, that needs to persistently be on our prayer radar. Those horizon issues that don't touch necessarily our personal lives, but we need to pray for them. Yes. But don't use that as an excuse. It almost sounds like people who push back on this say they're theologizing, and it almost comes across as a false humility. Oh, I'm not going to pray for specific things in my life. It sounds so humble to say that, but I'm going to suggest to you it's pride masked as humility. Because God really cares for specific issues of your intimate daily thought process, your life, your words, your actions, your lack of actions, your medical issues, your healing, every cell of your body. He really cares. God loves you and what you deal with. Not just what the people of Maui deal with. Yes, that's devastating. But don't just contrast yourself to them and say, well, they've got problems. We need to pray for them. You've got problems, too, and what you deal with and what I deal with. God loves you and what you deal with. And here's what I'm trying to do with this point. I'm trying to lift up the theological truth about God. It's called the doctrine of omniscience, that almighty God holy God is omniscient. That means he knows things before they happen. Amen? Psalm 139, verses 3 and 4, that's why, that's why David wrote this. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it. 
God knew what you were thinking this morning a million years ago. He's omniscient. Have we forgotten that? And when Jesus said in Luke 12, 7, that's why I gave you those references. When Jesus said in Luke 12, 7, why your heavenly father knows the number of hairs on your head. And when I look at my head, I realize God doesn't have to do algebra anymore. I don't think when Jesus said that, he was making what, what scholars would say a hyperbole, a hyperbole, hyperbolic statement, an exaggerated point to make a point about God. I think he was literally saying, God knows the number of hairs on our head. Amen? I mean, that's how I interpret that. I'm trying to lift up God's omniscience about your life. That's the whole basis. And you might say, it's this stupid axe, axe head. Oh, my problems, this is stupid. No, it's not. If it's important to you, it's important to God. I don't care what it is. It's important to you. It's important. You know, I know you get that, but you know what amazes me when I think of omniscience and specifics and details? I'm not in this world very often, and in fact, I praise God I'm not in this world. At least I, I was a few years ago, because I had to be operated on. Well, it's what, what amazes me is surgeries today. How specific and detailed how minute they are. I mean, I'm old enough to remember, and I've got a scar on my knee for repairing ligament damage. I won't show it to you. <laughs> well, they just had to slice open my knee. Now they do all of that with just a little, little tube and stuff inside that tube called laparoscopic surgery. How do they do that? Who invented stents that go inside arteries? That's, a, that's kind of a modern invention, right? <laughs> Who invented those? That is so specific and so detailed. How do they suck your gallbladder out through those laparoscopic things? I do not know. I mean, just think of that, how specific and detailed surgeries are today, and especially on your body. Aren't you glad? That if you had to have heart surgery or open heart surgery, or perhaps uh, many of you have had a knee replacement, aren't you glad that your surgeon, like, okay, specifically, we're going to cut that, but we're not going to cut that. Aren't you glad? So specific and minute? I certainly am. Man, that's just a human illustration to sort of put our minds about the omniscience of Almighty God. That's what I'm trying to lift up. And sometimes we look, we do look at our lives. Oh, yeah, it's just a stupid accent. Not to God, it isn't. And that's where you defeat yourself and your faith right there. Oh, it's not important. Yes, it is. If you're praying about it, and I hope you are, it's important. The Holy Spirit's leading you to make it important because it's important. The second encouragement, when I think of this story and I think of my individual prayer life, here's a real challenge. Very simply to pray over, pray about specific issues or details, the more intimate, the better. So we read in verse 5 that Elisha took a stick. And he said, well, where is the axe head? Now, whether it was close to the bank or not, I think it was further out. I think the guy was flaying on one way and the thing flies off. Myself. But it doesn't say that. I just kind of speculate that. I think it's sitting out in the middle of the Jordan. So Elisha takes this stick and I don't think that picture gives us that detail because it shows Elisha with the stick. Um, 
I think he took a stick, he threw it out there. The text says he threw it out there. What's that got to do with it? I don't know. I really don't know. It's fun investigating through various commentaries. All you have to do is Google. Google the scripture reference, and man, you get a plethora of, of interesting insights about the stick. Was it symbolic? Did, <laughs> this is kind of, was it like a bobber when you're fishing? He could kind of spot it. So when it does float, you'll know where it's at. Was it a prophetic? I think it was a prophetic act. I mean, when you look at Elisha and when he throws salt into the Jericho water system, and, and, he, and he prophesies that the water's going to be clean. How, how do you reason that chemically? Was that a symbolic thing to throw salt in? I don't know. But that was a miracle. And, and I'll talk about miracles in a moment. But he throws the stick in. I believe it was a prophetic act of saying, I'm going to do something about that. I don't, Elisha didn't say, oh, too bad, so sad. You... Um, you're going to have to chop trees down with something else now. No, I'm going to do something about it. And so he throws a stick in. Now, I know it's kind of a jump from throwing a stick into prayer, but I'm going to make that jump because I believe one of the greatest prophetic acts that you do in life is to pray over specific issues and details of your personal life. You can't stand a person start praying about it. You're struggling with a decision and a tension within you, start praying about it. That's an important detail of your life. You're struggling financially, start praying about it. You can't pee in the morning, start praying about it. Well, I've been there. I mean, how real do you want to get with life? If it's important to you, it's important to God. So start praying about it. Now, I'm going to challenge you about specific prayer because I just said God is omniscient, so why do you have to pray anyway? That's a good question, by the way. That's a really good question. And in fact, it's sort of a theological cop-out. Well, God knows anyway. So I'm going to talk about a couple of issues about praying specifically. Why, why be specific in prayer, as specific as you can be? As specific, as intimate, as whatever. Why? Because number one, the more specific, the more intimate with Jesus as your friend. You get specific with Jesus, your friend, and you, you grow in your intimacy. If you keep, if you keep Jesus distant, and just say, generally, I just pray for this, I think Jesus stays distant. He's in your heart, you're saved, but this growth as Jesus as your friend continues in your life because you are, Jesus, I am really struggling with this. And Jesus is going, I know, but let's just keep developing a friendship here. Just keep, let's talk about it. The more specific you are in your life, I don't have food tonight. Okay, there's ways to deal with that, but the more specific you are, the more intimate with Jesus. I'll, I'll illustrate this with a dumb illustration in a moment. The second thing, when I think of specific prayers, and why be specific, I think of this, the more specific, the more real God becomes to you. The more specific you are, the more God shows up and becomes more intimate and more powerful. So I ask you this question. I ask you this question. Are we afraid to be specific? And the answer is yes, we are. Every one of us, I am. Because if I'm specific in my prayers, I make myself vulnerable. To God, anyway. I make myself vulnerable. I'm, I'm saying, God, I really need this to happen in my life. I make myself vulnerable, and I don't like to be embarrassed and I don't know about you, but I don't like the feeling of disappointment. Now, not everything I'm praying is God's will, and I'm not going to, that's not my message today. I'm just trying to challenge, are we afraid to be specific? Now, in this message, I have targeted needs 
and blessings in your life and in my life. But what struck me late last night, and I didn't prepare this late last night, by the way, I've been working on a long time. What struck me is it was the Holy Spirit. Why are we not specific about our sin before God? We're afraid to be. He knows them anyway. He knows the cravings inside of all of us. And I think we generalize our sins. I know you've forgiven me. Here's, the, here's, here's my terrible laundry. I think Jesus wants us to be specific about the dirty socks. <laughs> I really don't like that person, Jesus. I really don't like him. I think that's sin, by the way. I really don't like him. Okay, let's, be specific. let's confess that. Why are we not specific about our sins? I think we're even afraid to do that. But why are we afraid to be specific about just ordinary prayer requests? I need this to happen in my life. This would be a miracle if this happened, and I'm specifically putting this before you, Jesus. I lost my debit card. It's a stupid axe head to everybody else, Jesus, but not to me. Wow. So here's, here's kind of a just a real... It's not a stupid illustration, it's a pretend one. I kind of enjoy going to the dentist, and maybe if you don't, then, then just receive this illustration as a prophetic statement. <laughs> I, I don't enjoy going to the dentist, but it's one of those necessities I just don't stress over, like I might go to a doctor or some of the, the cancer-related treatments I had. So, um, or a colonoscopy, by the way, that's a big stress. Why did I even bring that up? Because we're all getting there anyway. going to the dentist. Now, it's one thing if you pray, and I hope you do pray. I hope you do pray. God, would you help me as I go to the dentist? Okay. He hears that. He didn't put you on voicemail. You didn't get a wrong number. He heard that. But how, how freeing would it be if you spent a little more time in prayer and say this, oh God, Every time, for whatever reason, when I sit in a dentist chair, I just get real tense. Would you help me to breathe when I'm in the dentist chair? For whatever reason, I'm just tense. Would you just help me to breathe and relax before I get that nitro oxide going? Would you just help me to breathe? That's being specific. And God, I cannot stand it when they stick that needle in my gum to deaden me. Would you help me get through that and deaden me to the deadening process? That'd be my specific prayer. And God, every time that, that they suck that stuff out of my mouth, I gag. Would you help me not to gag and feel embarrassed when I slobber over myself? Am I trying to be real and descriptive here? And then God... Would you give me peace when I see the bill? <laughs> That's specific. See what I did? Instead of just saying, bless me when I go to the dentist chair or the dentist appointment, you are praying over four specific things. And I believe God will show up. And he'll bless you in that dentist chair. And maybe he'll heal your teeth without having to go to the hallelujah since I'm talking about miracles. Now, here's a question I wrestled with for this message. <laughs> and maybe you're wrestling with it, which I hope you are. Can God move and answer and provide without us being specific in prayer? How would you answer that? Absolutely. Your specificity and my specificity is not conditional to God. Obviously, you've had, you've had miracles happen. We've all had provisions and answers, and God opened doors and did things in our life, perhaps healings, everything, and we weren't specific at all. In fact, we probably didn't pray about it. God, just in his goodness and his love, blessed our lives. Amen? So, yes, I, I do not want to be specific. This, this point about being specific in prayer about acts have things in your life 
or sitting in the dentist chair to, to do two things. Number one, to make you feel like you're in a restaurant with God and you ordered well done and you got rare and you're going to send it back. You ever done that in a restaurant? <laughs> I'm sending it back. I ordered well done. No, that's not an attitude about prayer. Nor do I want it to be fear-based. Because you're... Every one of us faced challenging things, perhaps even this week, you didn't have a chance to pray about at all. And God will go in front of you. So I don't want this to be a fear base. You end up in some critical situation. You go, I didn't pray about this. I didn't pray about it. Oh, no. I'll miss out on God's blessing. No, you won't. What I'm trying to do is, is get us to think deeper about our personal prayer life and to be specific and allow this intimacy with Jesus to blossom and, and this intimate and, and this sense of God shows up in specific dentist chair appointments. He shows up because it's based on a theology of his omniscience. Now the final challenge, encouragement, that I want to give us this morning is really the crux of this passage. But it's interesting that Spurgeon spent a lot of time on, on God's care in his commentary on that. I thought, well, if Spurgeon spends time on it, I should spend time on it. Thirdly, God is still in the miracle business. Amen? Still in the miracle business. Well, you'd all agree with that. Let's talk about the axe head floating for a moment. In fact, it'd just be a great thing just to read through 2 Kings, all the things that Elisha did. Axe head floating. Threw the stick out. It floated. For some odd, strange reason, God suspended the laws of gravity, except there's gravity in water, the laws of physics, this axe head, this iron, floated to the top. I take that literally here. That's awesome. Let me just say something about miracles and then say, and then go a little personal about why we might even struggle. When you read a miracle like this, the axe head floating, some of you are going, oh, I believe it. Yeah, amen. Some of you might go, oh, I don't know if that happened. Because you've never seen something like that before. Some of you might pick and choose what miracles you believe in. I don't know if I believe in the axe head floating. Okay. Which miracles are you going to pick and choose then? Because one day we're all going to die. It seems to me it's a miracle that Jesus comes and takes us to a place where he is. That's miraculous. Does anybody struggle with that one? I don't. I don't think you do either. Because you've been raised in Christian teaching that has said when we die, our soul goes to be with Jesus. When we're in Jesus, you don't struggle with that miracle. That's a greater miracle than the axe head floating. That something happens to your spirit when you die that the Jesus Christ or his angel takes you to paradise and takes me to paradise. Your body just doesn't turn to ashes or dust or whatever it turns to. There is eternal life in Jesus Christ. Amen? Well, that's a greater miracle than the axe head floating. Do you believe in the physical resurrection of Jesus? Do you believe that Lazarus was raised back from the dead in his restored flesh? I do. My faith is built upon on the third day, he rose again. And nobody has proven 
likewise. I, I believe in history. I believe in, I believe in what Jesus said. I will rise again, and nobody, nobody has provided even, even a scant historical argument of what happened to the body of Jesus, let alone what the Bible says. So what miracles are you going to pick and choose then? You don't believe that, but you believe this. Or you just accept them all. You believe in a supernatural God. Now, i, I got to say that because, because for some of you, this may have been the first time you, you've even come, even encountered this in the Bible. An axe head floating. Maybe you've been in church for a long, long time and you never even knew this story. The axe head. Supernatural. I don't have to explain it. I don't know how the laws of physics were suspended and the axe head floated. Elijah said it's going to float. It did. Wow. But you know what? That may not be your theological problem at all. Here's what I think most of our problem is, but I did want to say that about miracles. I think what our, most of our problems is we believe in miracles. We just all have discouraged areas of our life where we've never seen God move in a particular area. That's probably where most of us are at. We believe in miracles, and it may, and it may create kind of a tension whenever I preach on miracles, or you read a book about miracles, or you talk about it, think about God will make a way, and you see that discouraged area in your life. We all have them. So the need to be refreshed about his intervention is so This week, I, I took the church van down to Crow. Just I had to haul a bunch of supplies, and it's easier to do that in the van. So the gas gauge in the van, as I'm coming back, and by the way, you get past Harden coming this way, there's nowhere to get gas. Just thought I'd mention that. <laughs> so you get past Harden coming this way, and that van gas gauge was between empty and half of a quarter. And I'm going, do I take a chance on this thing or not? By the grace of God, I stopped at the love station and, of course, filled up or got a lot. I don't want to take a chance and be out there and have to push the van by myself or have Dennis push it. <laughs> what does that got to do with miracles? Nothing. It has to do with being refueled. Because I think for most of us, the emotion, the faith gauge, the emotional gauge, the expectancy gauge is running on empty. In some area of your life, maybe not in every area of your life, but in some areas, I just don't know if God's ever going to do anything in that thing, that person's life. I don't know if he's going to do anything in my kid's life, my grandkids, my my situation, my finances, I, I, even my health issues, even, even whatever, whatever kind of you're putting before the Lord, I think all of us, our gauges get kind of low, and the need to be refreshed in God's miraculous ways is so important that God is still in the miracle business. And you know what? I wish I, wish I could invent a pill that would just ignite us inside, but it's got to be a work of the Spirit. God, you're God, and you're in the miracle business. We do get discouraged about specific areas of our life. That's why I'm preaching on this point. God is still in the miracle business. And secondly, God wants to stir. If he can float an axe head, he can do things in my life. He can do things in, in our situation. He can do things. Now, as I finish this message, I, I want to finish it with three reminders. Let's kind of pull everything together here about God's omniscience. He cares, our praying specifically, as well as God is in the miracle business. Number one, number one, just a reminder. I, here's two of them right here. Admit I need refueling. I think it's okay to admit. I've kind of lost sight of a God of miracles in my life. I've kind of lost sight of that. I don't, my prayers are very short-sighted, you might say. Um, I, I don't. I don't pray much because I don't want to feel disappointed anymore. Admit you need refueling. It's okay to admit that. 
I think the devil does a work on all of our lives. Just don't expect anything from God. You'll never get disappointed. No. Admit you need refueling. You just need to go to the, to the word. You need to go in prayer. God, excite me about miracles. I would say secondly, when I think of this story, and when I think of praying specifically, we don't make the access close. God does. Amen. He makes the access close. Yeah, I know Elisha has something to do with it. He spoke it. He prayed. God, God raised it. And maybe, maybe that speaks to somebody here today, that you're trying to do something. You're trying to convince somebody. You're trying, yeah, we need to talk to people. We need to, but you know what? It's God who makes the access close. And thirdly, my specific miracle is huge to me. Any of these reminders, this is the one I want you to leave with. Whatever your specific axe head thing is, it's huge to you. It may not mean anything thing to anybody else, but it's huge to you. And that's where you need to be. To the other prophets here in the story, getting the axe head back meant nothing, but to that one prophet, it was huge. God reminded me of a story, just to finish with, talk about a miracle. Um, and I want to leave you with this. It, 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 it kind of jogs a memory. It's probably because I shared it before. It's been a long time ago. J.P. Moreland, outstanding scholar, professor of philosophy at, at Talbot Center, written books about apologetics. Great, great mind of Christ. Uh, I've met him before years ago. He spoke at the Holy Spirit Conference. Just, just a brilliant mind. Has mentored philosophy, Ph.D. people who are at Harvard and Notre Dame. I mean, he has really done a work for the body of Christ. So he writes in his book called Experiencing Miracles. Great book, by the way, about miracles and theology of miracles and philosophy of miracles. Uh, Experiencing Miracles, J.P. Moreland. So he writes this story uh, about 2005. He's going through a demonic attack went through a, a very serious time of depression. He began to listen to a lot of his negative self-talk, which he believes was demonically infused in his life. And that's a whole other subject. Just, just go with it right now. <laughs> and he says, I began to feel very depressed about my teaching and everything I was offering. And I started listening to voices that what I do doesn't make any difference and I had to quit. And, and he just kind of kind of went down the rabbit hole of depression. And, uh, but, but in the midst of this, I mean, he's probably teaching classes feeling this is of no avail at all. He's a brilliant mind, just a brilliant mind. In the midst of this, he took a speaking engagement in South Carolina. A series of lectures and, at churches or university there in the summer. So he gets off the plane. He's greeted by a host. He's taken to a hotel. They had dinner. It was like a Saturday night. The lectures start on Monday. Again, keep in mind, he is struggling internally. Like, it, does my life, my teaching, whatever I do, it, is it, it's just all in vain. It's nothing. I know he said it really got bad. But he took this, this um, series of teachings uh, in South Carolina. He said he'd never been to South Carolina. They had dinner. He went to his hotel. And in the middle of the night, he got extremely sick. He, he said, he, he writes in the book, he never struggled with headaches and he got this pounding migraine headache. He got so sick, he called the host. He said, I better go to the hospital. I mean, he believes in healing, but he was so sick. Took him to the emergency room. He left his driver's license at the front desk of the emergency room, 
and that's part of the story. They take him to a bay, and he said his blood pressure is off the charts, his, his headache, his, his head's pounding, he's so nauseous, he's throwing up. The doctor walks in to his bay with his driver, driver's license. Emergency room physician. And the emergency room physician says, this driver's license says you're J.P. Moreland. Are you the J.P. Moreland from Talbot Seminary, the one who's written all these books? And he goes, and so he's so sick, he goes, yeah, that's me. The emergency room physician says, are you kidding me? He goes, our nurses here pray. They literally pray that some celebrity would walk through our hallways here and, and they would get to meet a celebrity. And he said, I get to meet you. Now, J.P. Moreland writes, in, I'm so sick. He said, I don't understand the significance. The doctor goes, your books, your teachings have changed my life. He said, I'm teaching an ethics course at the college right now as a physician. And he said, I am using your book on some book on the philosophy of ethics. And he said, I'm using your book as my textbook. He said, your stuff on apologetics, your stuff on, on, on um, life in Christ and how to understand history and how to understand the Bible have changed my life. And I get to meet you here in the emergency room. And then the doctor says, oh, by the way, you just got food poisoning. You'll be better in the morning. We'll give you some stuff for that. Now, God didn't create the food poisoning. But J.P. Moreland writes here, he says, I'm, I was stunned. And he said, as the doctor left, he said, the Lord spoke to me. He didn't say the Lord spoke to him in an audible voice. But the Lord spoke to him and said this. I am well pleased with your academic work for my name's sake. You have done well. Keep trusting me. And you know what? That moved a mountain in his life. That doesn't rock your boat. I get that. You're probably excited about that story. It inspires me, but that didn't, that didn't his story. But your miracle, whatever it is, is huge to you. That was a huge miracle to him. I know it speaks to you, but the point is that changed his life. That did something to him. That's what God wants to do in all of our lives. Your specific miracle, that axe head, for J.P. Moreland, that night, the axe head floated. What is it in all of our lives. Father God, oh God, we just thank you for your love. We just thank you for your omniscience, for your care. We just thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, that you are more intricately, intimately <laughs> involved in our lives more than we ever give you glory or credit. In fact, probably many of us have said, God, do you not know that I'm dealing with this? We just thank you. We thank you that you invite us to be so specific about the dentist chair issues of our life. We thank you for friendship that continues to grow. Thank you that while we may not be as specific about sin, but take us to deeper levels about that. We thank you that you're in the miracle business. Whatever we kind of dismiss as an axe head. You want to you want us to see a miracle. And we thank you for miracles awaiting us. Not so much to make us feel better, but that'll be one part of it, but that we would testify of how good you are to 
brother. And so, Father God, we just thank you. When we sing this song, and, and we're going to leave the building, we just thank you that you make a way where there seems to be no way. Thank you. Can we just put that everything else on hold and just say thank you for hearing our prayers, hearing our cries, that you know the numbers of hairs on our head. You know what we're going to say at 3 o'clock today. We just praise you, Father. Be awesome. Be awesome in our lives because we need you. Whatever you feel it is right now, before we even kind of go to a song, whatever you feel it is that's an ax head in your life, would you just put that before the Lord right now? It may just be 30 seconds of saying, this is the ax head in my life. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Let's stand as we sing. God will make a way. God will make a way where there seems to be no way. He works in ways we cannot see. He will make a way for me. He will be my guide, holding closely to his side. With love and strength for each new day, he will make a way. He will make a way. Go in the grace of God.